Praise the Lord, everybody. Hey, it's good to be with you on this fine Sunday. And uh, we're here today to lift up the name of Jesus. He deserves it. And uh, he deserves all of our praise and worship that we can give him today. Um, for a moment, I would like to encourage somebody that uh, that's going through uh, uh, things in your life that uh, you never thought you would face. I want to encourage you to turn to the Lord today, to turn to him, call out his name. And I promise you, he will be there to help you. Praise the Lord. A scripture came to mind this morning in Isaiah 41 and 10. It simply says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Praise the Lord. So just cry out to the Lord today. He'll never fail us. He'll never forsake us. He'll bring us through the trial, the, uh, the fiery furnace, so to speak. My God is an all-powerful God that can do anything we need. Praise the Lord. This morning, I would like to open up our service with a song that is fastly becoming one of my favorites. Uh, uh, it's called, I'm Going to See a Victory, and I believe we will if we'll turn to the Lord and let Him fight our battles. Praise the Lord. serve knows only how to triumph my God will never fail my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord there's power in the mighty name of Jesus Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. I, I know how this story ends. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory for the battle. battle belongs to the Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turned it for good. You turned it for victory. 
victory. Do you believe it? Hey, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. We're going to see a victory. We're going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. We're going to see a victory. We're going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Praise the Lord, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the service. Sister Tina's coming to sing praise and worship to us. And uh, let's join her in singing and worshiping. And Pastor Coon's bringing a wonderful message. Let's get with the man of God. In Jesus' name. Praise the Lord, everyone. So glad to be with you for praise and worship today. I hope everyone is having a blessed week. We are so blessed, aren't we? God is so good to us. I'm thankful for his faithfulness. I say that about every week, but I truly am thankful for his faithfulness. Where would we be without a faithful God? He's so loving and so true and so kind to us. Praise God. Worship today. Let's worship him together. Bless you in Jesus' name.
could ever take your place, Lord Jesus. We exalt you today. We bless your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Pastor Butler, for leading us into a spirit and attitude of praise and worship today. And I do hope that you are not just listening, but are participating in praise and worship. Praise, while we enjoy it being corporate, where many of us come together, it's also very individual. As a fining pot to silver, so is a man to his praise. It's a very individual thing. I'm going to talk with you today about the spirit of Antichrist. And in order to get to that point, we have to talk a bit about the Antichrist. And in, in the scripture, it's interesting. John is the only Bible writer who uses the word Antichrist. And he uses it four times in the first two little epistles that he writes that are near the end of the New Testament. Now, other writers speak of this person who will become the Antichrist. He is called the man of sin, and uh, he is portrayed as a false prophet. He is represented, as many of you know, by the number 666, which have been called the number of a man. And these help in describing the last days, a man of sin, and uh, this one who is going to put in place a universal economic system who is going to require humanity to have a number in order to do business. That helps us to understand what the Antichrist is going to do. Now, we can know some things about what this Antichrist is going to do. For the sake of peace, he's going to bring together a worldwide alliance of all nations. And it could well be, because we are more a worldwide community than we have ever been, it could well be that he uses the global entities that already exist. He will certainly use global entities much like those that exist. For financial and economic stability around the world, he will create a one-world banking system that uses no cash. He will put in place a worldwide numbering system that will be required for any of us to transact business. And perhaps most challenging of all, he's going to bring religions together into some agreement, into some cohesive system of worship. And when I have considered all of the things that are involved in this person, this man of sin, the Antichrist, becoming who and what he says he will become, it is very clear that this particular part of it is the last piece of the puzzle that I'm not sure has begun to come together to the degree that it will need to. Because we're not just talking about someone who brings together various sects of Christianity, but he is going to bring together Hinduism and Judaism and Islam and all of the other varied religions of the world will come fitting into that system. It will be ecumenical as there has never been an ecumenical movement. The only existing power that would have any likelihood of being able to do such a thing emanates from Rome. It has uh, incredible influence and has already been in discussion with Protestants, particularly Protestants, who the Catholic Church feels belong to them already because they adhere to that particular premise of baptizing using what the Church of Rome has instructed should be done, the titles Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. There's also been discussion among all of the other various great religions of the world. This is going to be something of a challenge, but this man of sin, the Antichrist, is going to be able to do this. And because of what he's brought together, there will be peace and there will be prosperity and um, things will be extremely well for several years and then 
there's going to be three and a half years of incredible distress and conflict. This is the seals and the trumpets and the vials and horsemen that you read about in the book of Revelation. This is very real. And on so many of these fronts, the world is ready now for a one world government. The world is ready now for a one world financial system. Previously, without the internet, it would have been very hard for there to be the connectivity in order to create this union. But today, things are in place. And around the world, there are conflicts. Around the world, there is economic chaos. Around the world, there is distrust of existing governments. The world is ready for anything that would bring a measure of peace. So, we're getting ready for all of these things. There will be a one world government. There will be a one world economic system. There will be a one world church. And I don't have any idea of who the Antichrist is going to be. I don't know what uh, his preferences of life will be. But I believe that the stage is mostly already built. I believe the platform on which the Antichrist will exercise his authority is just about there. Surely you can see it. I mean, we have the establishing of systems such as there have never been. We have uh, this collecting of powers with one world government, with a court, a judicial system, the World Bank, the uh, World Council of Churches, the United Nations, all of these things speaking to unity, all of these things speaking to an identity that is shared, that we are citizens of this world. And it is that which the Antichrist is going to uh, build his influence on. So I, I, I think today that, I, and I feel a little bit like John the Baptist may have felt when he began crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord. Uh, repent, repent, repent. Uh, the Lord's coming and He's going to baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. I, I, I feel like that there needs to be some crying out today. It's not time to dabble. It's not time to fool about. It is time to understand how close we are that the clock, the minute hand and the seconds are swiftly moving Closer and closer, nearer and nearer to the experiences that are going to come as part of the Antichrist. There is an incredible call for revival. There is an incredible call for repentance. Now, as I said, John, who had spent much time with Christ, is the one who speaks of the anointed one. And he made an interesting observation. It's in 1 John 4 and 3. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Now I want you to notice specifically what John writes. John had received the spirit of Christ. John had walked with and talked with and been part of the inner circle of Christ. He knew about Christ. He knew about the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Ghost. But he says that there will be a spirit of Antichrist. So just like there is a spirit of Christ, the Holy Ghost, there is a spirit of Antichrist. And so he says, and this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now, Already is it in the world. That's a startling statement. This is one of the four times when John uses this word Antichrist, that the spirit 
of Antichrist is already in the world. This is only decades after the crucifixion of Christ. And obviously John was not referring to the man of sin. So what is it then that John is talking about when he says that this spirit of Antichrist is even now already in the world? And I believe that in many ways this particular conversation is more significant than the personage of the Antichrist. More important than knowing where he's coming from or what color his hair will be, this is important, that the spirit of Antichrist is even now already in the world. If the spirit of Antichrist was present in the first century, how much more is it prevalent in the 21st century? So let me just kind of work through this with some questions that perhaps will be in your mind and uh, I'll try to take this slow, maybe a little bit longer than I have been at times. What is this idea, the Antichrist, doth already exist? Well, we can't understand the Antichrist until we understand Christ, which leads to another question. So what or who is Christ? Well, the word Christ refers to the Jewish Messiah. It is the English version of a Greek word, Christos, and it means the anointed one. Okay, so now we understand that Christ is the anointed one, but to what does this principle of anointing refer to? In the Old Testament, the idea of anointing involved the pouring of oil over someone's head. It, it wasn't a casual thing. You didn't just anoint kind of whosoever will. It, it, was a, it, it was quite a thing. And it was reserved for specific roles that were going to be filled. Priests were anointed. They served as mediators between God and man. Prophets were anointed because they foretold the future, but more often they were foretellers of the Word of God for a community or for a nation at a very present point in time. And then kings were anointed to both lead and to govern. So to be anointed was significant. It indicated a degree of power. It integrated a degree of influence and an impact came with anointing. Isaiah 10 and 27 said the yoke will be broken because of the anointing. So Christ, the anointed one, the one who breaks yokes, the one who has power. Ancient Israel, in their understanding of their future, they saw the Messiah coming to break the rule of foreign uh, power and domination and dominion over them. Christ, the anointed one. Which flows to another question. Do we have an identity for Christ? Well, one of the earliest indications of who Christ was, was it came when a gentleman by the name of Andrew went to his brother, fisherman by the name of Simon Peter and said, you got to come with me. We have seen the Christ. We have seen the Messiah. Later, Andrew's brother would declare that God has made this same Jesus who you have crucified. He is both Lord and and Christ. So Jesus, God, manifest in the flesh, fully God, fully man. He is the anointed one. He is the Christ. So a further question might be, well, Pastor, all of that's kind of interesting, maybe, but 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 what is it? matter? What difference does it make? Well, one day Jesus went to his home synagogue in Nazareth and part of the synagogue service allowed someone in the audience to 
step out and they would read a passage of scripture and then comment on it. So Jesus stood and he went and he took a scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he read a passage that most of the people present would have been familiar with. Isaiah uh, has been called the Messianic prophet because he wrote more about the coming Messiah than did any of the other Old Testament prophets. And because this was part of Israel's hope, this portion of scripture, these references to the coming Messiah would have been read quite often because it gave them an anticipation. It gave them a hope of what the future was going to look like. So Jesus steps out, he takes that scroll, and he reads from Isaiah chapter 61, the first two verses. And here's what Jesus reads. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. No wonder Israel had hope. No wonder they loved this portion of Scripture. Many of them would have been able to quote it because it gave an expectation of what was going to be the coming Messiah, empowered, influential, able to address the issues of man. They'd heard it before. They'd heard people comment on it before. It wasn't unusual for Isaiah 61 to be read. But Jesus read this portion of Scripture, and without the usual and expected commentary, he just went and sat down. This wasn't what they'd anticipated, so the, the group of people just watched him. He finally said, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. What scripture? Let's read it again. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek, good news. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Some of you who are in grief and have been smitten by so much that is hurting and wounding. He binds up the brokenhearted and he proclaims liberty to those that are captives, to addictions, to all sorts of things that control one's life. And he opens the prison. To those that are bound. I'm the Christ. That's, that's what he said to them. And I'm paraphrasing. He said, I'm the Christ. I'm, I'm this anointed one. I have been anointed to do these things. And so Christ, the anointed one, comes with power. He comes with deliverance. He comes with liberty, with transformation. And he comes with hope. He is king, prophet, and priest. And Jesus said, I'm the one. Others had said it of him previously. Andrew had said to Simon Peter, come see, we've, we've found the Messiah, we've found the Christ. Many would say it later. And all of us will eventually say it. We will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But in the community of Nazareth, Jesus, imagined to be the carpenter's son, has identified himself as the Messiah. People in Nazareth weren't too keen on that, and the outcome was as could be expected. They kind of ran him out of town. But we need to put that aside, because if you seek liberty, if you're looking for deliverance, if you need hope in your life, if you need the power of God to save and transform, you need this anointed one. Jesus said, I'm him. I can do this for you. And he can. Interestingly enough, when we begin to talk about the Holy Ghost, it is denoted several times in the New Testament as the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of the Anointed One, the Spirit of the One who is King, Priest, and Prophet, the One who is the Ruler and Governor of Life, the One who foretells and gives direction, the One 
who speaks and, and leads and guides and mediates between God and man, the Holy Ghost. And those that have the Holy Ghost have the spirit of the anointed one. It brings good news, it heals, it preaches deliverance, it gives recovering of sight, and it sets at liberty those that are bound. We need, we don't just need, it's not just an opportunity to have, but we must have the Spirit of Christ. The book of Romans said, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But why would it have to be said that way? with all of the benefits and the gains that would come to you having the Holy Ghost. Who wouldn't want to have the Spirit of Christ in their life? If you don't have the Holy Spirit today, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ and you want to know more, we have exceptional personal Bible study teachers who Perhaps you can meet them in a coffee shop or they can come to your home or a library meeting room or an office somewhere or a park bench. They'd enjoy spending time with you and they're qualified and capable of teaching the Word of God. Well, you can tell that I love to talk about Jesus the Christ. I love to talk about the Anointed One. I need to say all of those things to get us to the place where we can talk about the anti Christ. But I re it'd be so easy to just keep talking about Christ. So pastor, you've told us about Christ who is the Antichrist. Well, I, I can't tell you that. That remains God's secret. Uh, it's potentially soon to be unveiled. Surely you can see that things are in place. We've talked about Christ. What is the Antichrist? And immediately we all think of anti as being in opposition to another. And we see a very simple picture. It's two forces on the field. The Antichrist is on one side and Christ is on the other side. And there are competing forces that are opposed to each other and they clash. They come together. And so it will be at the Battle of Armageddon. The Antichrist and his followers against Jesus Christ, his followers, and the nation of Israel. But John talked less about Antichrist, the person, than he did about the spirit of Antichrist. And most significantly, that the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. The word that John uses here in connection with Christ, anti, or the word anti, meant to be someone who took the position of another. He sat in a seat or took a room for himself that rightfully belonged to someone else. So yes, it is to be in opposition but the opposition is going to come as the Antichrist and the spirit of Antichrist attempt to take the place of priest and prophet and king in the world. And just now, the spirit of Antichrist wants to do exactly the same thing in our life, wanting to take the place of the Holy Ghost. The Antichrist, the man of sin who will eventually come, he will desire worship and homage and, and all of the respect that belongs to Jesus who is the Christ. He will want all of that for himself. But there's one problem. This imposter has no anointing. He has no power to bring deliverance or liberty or transformation to any human life. But John's emphatic. I come back to it. He's, he's emphatic. The Antichrist, now present, not a future personage, not someone who we need to question, but here now. The spirit of Antichrist wants to take the place of Christ. 
where that instead of being guided by the Spirit of Almighty God, guided by the Spirit of Christ in our lives, we would be guided by something that has subtly taken the place of Christ, who has pushed the Holy Ghost out of place, who has taken the throne. We need to be aware of that. And some would say, well, Pastor, I'm not Antichrist. I'm not opposed to, to Christ. Leads to another question that has to be posed for you. But ma'am, in your life, what has dispossessed or displaced the Spirit of Christ in you? What is it that has sat perhaps for decades and a, almost a generation now on the throne that belongs to Jesus Christ? Does a counterfeit king sit on the throne of your life? There's, there's not room for two kings on the one throne. The Spirit of Antichrist this subtle dispossessor. He'd, he'd rather subtly take the place than he had to go into a pitched battle. So, Pastor, can you identify the spirit of Antichrist, the Antichrist existing in the world today? Yes, John specifically warned of those who at one time had been part of the body of Christ. They're once full of the Holy Ghost, but now they live in apostasy and false doctrine. The spirit of Antichrist, the spirit that is opposed to the anointed one, the spirit that would imagine that any interruption, that any move of the spirit would be out of place, where tongues and interpretation and a word of prophecy and the exuberance of worship and praise, all of those things would be considered out of order. It's got to be careful and it's got to be structured and the spirit of falsehood, even the spirit of false doctrine has replaced the spirit of truth, the spirit of Christ, that which dispossesses the spirit of the anointed one. I want you to think about the others and as I share some of this quickly with you, you will have some other dispossessors of the anointed one that will come to your mind. Just type them in. Help us to think about this today. Pleasure. I just want to have fun. Has dispossessed the need in many people's lives for the Holy Ghost. Entertainment. Entertainment is intended to help us momentarily forget the realities of life. One writer put it, we're being entertained to death. Antichrist. Success can become Antichrist in our life. It can be, look what I've achieved. Look what I own. Look who I am. Surely the blessing of God is upon me, but wealth and prosperity and life success is no indication of the goodness or the blessing of God in any of our lives, it may well be that your success has taken the place of the Spirit of Christ in your life. To have power, to have influence with other people, to have chemicals added to my body that will control my mind, to live with self-will, to have a form of godliness, religion, even Christianity without the supernatural. So what is it that has dispossessed the Spirit of Christ in your life? What is it that would make you say, well, I, I, don't, I don't really need that? What is it that would make you imagine, I'm okay? Instead of the Spirit of Christ, instead of living my life full of the Holy Ghost and serving God with everything within me. I choose this. That particular thing is the antichrist that exists now in your life. It's, it's a very personal antichrist, a very personal dispossessing of the anointed one. So, Pastor, you've talked about the spirit of antichrist. What, what do we do? Well, we've got to push the antichrist off the throne of our lives. 
There's no anointing. There's only pretense there. He is a counterfeit. A counterfeit that won't cash. It, it, it won't pass muster. Success can't deliver a man from alcoholism. Entertainment and, and physical pleasure will set no captive free. You need, I need, we all need Jesus Christ coming into our lives as the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ or the Spirit of Antichrist. So how do we push this Antichrist out of the way? Well, first it begins with repentance. If you believe God, if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you follow through by saying, God, I repent of my sins. I'm sorry for having lived the way I've lived. I repent of my vulgarity. I repent of my immorality. I repent, and the list goes on. I repent of my dishonesty. I repent, I repent, I repent. And it's not just to say I'm sorry and make confession, but it is to do an about face and turn in God's direction to turn in the direction of Christ instead of in the direction of, of Antichrist. After you've repented, be baptized. Some of you will need to be rebaptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Today, we baptize several in the name of Jesus Christ. You need to be baptized after you repent because when you're baptized in the name of Jesus the scripture says you're robed in Christ don't let anybody tell you that baptism is insignificant you're robed in Christ whenever you're baptized in his name and then allow God to fill you with the spirit of Christ allow him to fill you with the Holy Ghost that's what we're needing we're needing the Holy Ghost not just repentance we need the Holy Ghost not just to have been baptized, we need the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost is the supernatural. Now there are things that happen behind the scenes in the invisible world when we repent, when we're baptized, we're forgiven, and the stain of sin is washed out of our lives. All of that's an invisible happening. But whenever you receive the Holy Ghost, it is supernatural, and there is a supernatural evidence that comes. It is the evidence of speaking words of praise regarding the Lord Jesus Christ in words that you don't understand. The book of Acts in chapter 2, chapter 10, chapter 19 calls it speaking in tongues. Today is a good day to become a born-again Christian. Right where you are, you can repent of the spirit of Antichrist that has controlled your life and dominated your way of thinking. Today, there may well still be water in the tank. You could be baptized by calling for myself or Pastor Butler. You could be filled with the Holy Ghost today. The Spirit of Antichrist is prevalent in Springfield, Missouri. Antichrist is here. But listen, Christ is here as well. The spirit of Antichrist is present. But the spirit of Christ, the one that rightfully belongs on the throne of our life, Christ, Jesus Christ, his spirit, his presence is very real. And you can have the Holy Ghost. Jesus, I thank you today for truth that you brought to me, revelation you brought to me, an understanding that you've helped me with. And I hope today that I've been able to communicate in a way that gets this word across and helps people to understand who it is and what's going on with the spirit of Antichrist. Jesus, we need you just now. We need your touch. We need your anointing. We need there to be that convicting of the spirit. Let someone who has listened today do a serious assessment of their life regarding the spirit of Antichrist and regarding the spirit of Christ and let it be that tears roll down cheeks as people begin to repent. Let it be that there would be a stirring in the Holy Ghost as Tina sings. 
Oh God, give revival to our city. We have good people in our community who are religious and they're devoted and they will have been at church this morning, but the spirit of Antichrist rules in them. There are people who Pastor Butler and I lead and we're their shepherds, but today the spirit of Antichrist is far more dominant in their life than is the spirit of Christ. I ask in the name of Jesus that the Holy Ghost, that the drawing of the Father, the power of God, would reach across this community. Let revival break out in every church. Let there be an outpouring of the Spirit. We have hundreds and hundreds of churches. Let there be such a grand move of God that it cannot be stayed, that no liturgy, that no normal way of doing business, but let somebody in that group of people become so hungry for the Spirit of Christ that it can't be stopped and it can't be stayed. In Jesus' name, I pray it. I pray for you today. Obey God with your life. Worship with Tina today and please respond to what it is that the Spirit would have you do.
Lord Jesus. Let revival explode in this place, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.